Well, thank you. Thank you, Yanis, for uh, setting up automotive uh, as, uh, as, as an excellent practitioner of, of uh, robust design. I think, um, well, I I'll tell you a few things about, about how we're working at Jaguar Land Rover to try and improve um, what you might call the totality of robustness of our design. And there's some different aspects to, um, I guess, quite a mechanical view that, Yanis, you've just put over. There's some, some interesting uh, contrasts to that. I've been in involved in um, dimensional control, as we call it. It's really just geometric robust design for about 20 years at, uh, at Jaguar and Land Rover and some other customers as well. And uh, recently we've, we've undertaken some work to try and do something that has been in the back of my mind for about 10 or 15 years, is to understand the robustness of the style that underlies the, the car, to try and draw some of the requirements of the design of the car out of the style in the clay in the studio in the early days of, of the programme and try and understand what those requirements mean to us at a high level across the car and, and what that means in terms of process and, and uh, dimensional control. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of uh, design and perceived quality at uh, Jaguar Land Rover. They're two very, very important things to us, um, our two most important characteristics. Um, and delivering those with robustness is naturally part of the business case for any good engineering company. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about a piece of work that we did to uh, identify the need for this in, in the engineering process. And then I'm going to talk about a dimensional concept and a little bit about the application of uh, design, uh, design structure matrix tools to design graphic complexity at the end of, of my presentation. So the design structure matrix is definitely in there, but you'll have to bear with me for a little bit. I'm going to start with a video. We'll let that buffer for a moment, perhaps. Is this the version? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, Steve. Let's give that another try. It might just be buffering. No. Can we um, can we skip on perhaps uh, come back yeah. to the uh, video a little bit? Yeah, yeah. It's a it's it's a shame it's a shame we can't show that. Um, so so the the videos um, by one of our our, our chief designers, um, Ian Callum, who uh, designs all the Jaguars, and it's an emphasis of the importance of design quality and uh, and class leading design to to the Jaguar brand. Um, and he talks about F Pace, one of our new cars in market, a, a brand new segment for for Jaguar, the um, the crossover segment. Previously, having built sports cars and sporty saloons in the past, uh, we've moved into a, a new segment for Jaguar, the crossover segment. And he talks about the importance of carrying a design gene through from sports cars into, into crossover vehicles. Um, and so, so it's a, an extremely new type of product to us. It's a very different type of product. But that common theme needs to endure through the product. Um, and so equally important to, uh, to Jaguar DNA values is, is the, the idea of perceived quality. And for those of you not familiar with perceived quality, there's some words there that uh, describe the the ambience and the, the jewel-like quality of the interior of the car and the importance of that to, to customers who, who buy our cars. And what that translates to in my world is crafted quality, is the fit and finish, is the gap and flush, the alignment of all the features, the quality of the execution and the fit of those components together so that they look handcrafted, so that they look really beautifully put together. So with those two high importance values in in Jaguar Land Rover's um, brand DNA, um, we operate within a system engineering uh, model, and we, we, we attempt to uh, to put the car together in a in a sort of a logically structured manner, according to a, a kind of a, do, a W model. And what we'll do is we'll start off defining the customer experience, and we'll break that down into a detailed design based on the the embodiment design that I believe to Tobias is going to talk about a bit later, to uh, to draw out the implications of the customer experience requirements in the engineering. And then we'll go through a, a virtual 
uh, validation of the design, assembling the design, making sure that the gaps and flushes are right in some variation analysis software, um, some variation, some validation of the CAD in itself, you know, those kind of virtual, virtual analysis and validation activities. And then we'll commit to some tooling and we'll go and build the system and we'll put some cars together and we'll understand the individual part quality and we'll understand the, the way that that goes together to build a, a complete car. So I'll show you this because um, we, we did a, a mapping of the activities of our dimensional control and our APQP, the Automotive Quality Assurance process, um, against our, product, our production system a few years ago. And we looked at all these various different tasks that are owned by different groups and handed from one group to another over a period of time. And we looked for gaps, we looked for improvements, we looked for things that we could do better about the dimensional control process to improve the way that our, our product comes together. And really we struggled to see it against a timeline. And so we ended up rearranging that, those post-it notes on a, a piece of paper against our system W. And, and that highlighted the really significant importance of a dimensional concept to us. And a dimensional concept is quite an abstract idea for, for many people. It's kind of a, a description of how you're going to put the car together in order to meet those requirements, those, those high importance requirements. So I've attempted to define a dimensional concept here. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a collection of engineering and process that relates the groups of components, the systems of the car, to achieve the engineering requirements. And superficially, that's quite a simple, uh, simple set of words. But what that means is that it relates the exterior panels of the car and it chooses a set of datums, a set of locators, uh, to set those panels in the right place to get the right fit and finish conditions, to get the right shut, to get the right seal, to get the right aerodynamic uh, requirements um, of the doors. But also it could relate the pulleys on a V-belt drive. It could relate the subframes uh, underneath the car to get the right alignment of, of subframes, to get the right handling characteristics of the car. So that this dimensional concept, this set of engineering and process, relates the parts of the car together to achieve the targets. And what we really struggle with is when there's conceptual conflicts, when we have things that we have to deliver that are conflicted, that are coupled. And uh, this top example is um, an example from Range Rover, one of our recent launches, um, where the door uh, waste finisher runs along the top of the door between the A-post at the front end and the, uh, the rear door, uh, uh, the rear door B-post at the rear end. And there's gap and flush requirements at both ends of this finisher. And the size of the aperture between the doors and the, the A-post varies in size, and the size of the finisher varies. Everything varies. So it can be a real struggle to make those conditions at both ends of the, the component to get that really crafted fit and finish at both ends of the component. And so this is a coupled system. But it's also a really important part of the design. The, the waste finisher runs all the way around the waist of the car and it's a highlight of the car. It's a design high value requirement. And you might be tempted from a design robustness point of view to do something that a competitor does and run the door waste finisher underneath the exterior mirror and hide all the variability both in the size of the aperture and the length of the finisher underneath the, the mirror. So that's kind of clever, robust design, but it's not highlight design leadership design. And so we have to find ways to execute this. And this is perhaps where some of the aesthetic design requirements are slightly different to the functional design requirements. So to F-PACE. And um, F-PACE provided me with an opportunity to, to get involved with some design robustness tools that were part of my master's dissertation and uh, to give me uh, some insight into the way that the design, the dimensional concept for F-PACE's load space components work. And we can see the load space on the, on the left hand side here. So there's three things. Well actually as I was reading Martin's uh, thesis on the plane yesterday, a, a fourth thing occurred to me that I, I hadn't put on this slide and it was a bit late to edit it. But um, there are three ways of achieving a robust design. That Principally you can prioritise your requirements and you can select where to put your locators. You can choose one interface over another, just as, as the competitor had done on the waste finisher in the previous example. They'd chosen to locate at the back to the door to get the good fit there and run their variation out to the front. 
you can be selective. You can adopt manufacturing adjustment, and that might take a number of uh, character characteristics. It might be tuning a tool, it might be developing the size of the cavity to get the right size of component to get the right tolerances, and that's, or it might be setting the component in the right place as a craftsmanship operation, a manual operation on the side of the line. Or you might choose tight, tight tolerance requirements, and that's some, something that you were just kind of speaking against to a certain extent. Precision, sometimes that's necessary to deliver some of the other attributes. Um, and the fourth thing that occurred to me reading Martin's thesis was flexibility. That sometimes flexibility can work in our favour, that using the flexibility of the components where over-constraint is actually acceptable is, uh, so, is an opportunity to, to uh, achieve uh, good, robust designs elsewhere. So to my words about the um, design structure matrix. If you're familiar with design structure matrix, forgive me this, um, this, uh, this detailing, but design structure matrix is a way of relating components of the design together, identifying relationships between components of the design. So that these, these marks in the matrix here identify simple feed-forward relationships between parts one and part two and part two and part three. So those marks underneath the diagonal indicate straightforward, forward-facing relationships. Feedback relationships are coupling relationships we talked about in the door waste finisher example a moment ago are marks above the diagonal. And so we have a looping relationship here back through part three that loops us back to part one. And that mark goes above the diagonal. So it becomes quite a powerful tool when it's correctly used to identify coupling and to opportun identify opportunities to reduce the coupling in the design and to reduce you know, what Nam circled um, uh, the, the first axiom. So this is the F-Pace load space dimensional concept and we took a, a first pass through that design and we designed it kind of reasonably robustly to, uh, to variation, to hide variation at, at a, good, a good interface between the components and then allow us to deliver the design interfaces at the other interfaces. Um, and what you can see is that there's, there's some components there that are related by gap and flush requirements principally. And our challenge was to deliver all of those gap and flush requirements um, to, the, to the specs that had been set. Particularly in this area around the seatbelt ramp, where previously on other models we've had some trouble with um, delivering those areas, um, we were particularly interested in getting the fit and finish very, very good around that high focus customer area. So going back to design structure matrix, we captured all of those requirements, those gap flush requirements in, in the design structure matrix. And the nice thing about design structure matrix is you can move the parts, the, the parts around in the matrix and you can reconfigure the, the groups, you can, re, you can change the arrangement of marks around so that all those three matrices that you see show exactly the same design constraints, they show exactly the same parts, they're just organised differently. And what that kind of draws out is that some clustering around the uh, around the diagonal is a useful analytical tool that draw, it shows us some groups of components, it shows us some subsystems of parts that should be closely related and then somewhat related to other components by some kind of robust joint design or some choice about craftsmanship execution or precision execution, some addition of manufacturing uh, adjustment or some addition of uh, preci precise manufacturing. And so you can see, for contrast, the, um, the comparison there, which is the flow diagram that, that accompanies every design structure matrix. You can see the complexity in that uh, flow diagram, the relationships of those, those component parts within the design structure matrix. You can see how difficult it would be to draw the relationships out of that flow graph and how much better the design structure matrix is for illustrating these clusters of components that have to be related together. Incidentally, all these tools are... Uh, using the um, Cambridge Advanced Modeler published by EDC in Cambridge University. A really excellent tool for, uh, for developing and using design structure matrices. So we can see in the top half of the matrix the coupling that's inherent in the design, the, uh, the conflicts in the design between the, uh, the headline and the seat post and sit flight, the seat belt ramp and the load space and the top moulding. And what we really want to do is we want to draw out what that means to the design, how we can execute that, and try and take away the coupling in as many cases as possible. 
So here's the baseline design, and what I've done with the design structure matrix here is I've broken that down to another level of ab abstraction from the part level that we looked at previously. And the, the level of abstraction down from that is the component feature level of abstraction. So we're, we're now looking at the individual radiuses, the individual surfaces, the individual holes, slots, pins, tabs, the geometric features that make up those components. And we've got some marks that couple those components together by their cosmetic requirements. And so what we've done is, as we look at these various different marks is we can take the opportunity to do what uh, the DSM community call tearing in removing those marks and looking at what the design implications of removing that mark, that relationship is, whether that's increased precision in making the parts very precise so that they're located together very well or so that there's a very small tolerance stack up between the two, or designing the interface in such a way that uh, variation isn't evident, that variation is hidden. And so that gave us uh, some ability to look into the design and to decide whether those interfaces would be met by precision, flexibility, craftsmanship or selectiveness. And so here we've got um, a, a design alternative that we proposed um, to, uh, to the original design, which simplifies the design by removing some of these marks that are very highly uh, coupling of several of the parts. This interface, for instance, relates this component and this component and this component. And so that's a key pri priority to remove from the, the matrix to, to look at treating in a different way that can allow us to desensitise it. And so that, what that means is a shrouded joint in the area above the seatbelt ramp, a slip joint at the back of the, uh, at the, back of the um, load space moulding at the back of the seatbelt ramp and a socketed joint underneath the, the, the seat bolster. And here's another design alternative that we took by rearranging that matrix, taking some of the marks out and, and understanding another optimal design that there is that might give us a shrouded joint over the top of the seat belt and a socketed joint underneath with, a, with the joint between the um, seat belt ramp and the uh, load space top moulding seat post uh, removed entirely. So this is quite a powerful tool for developing design alternatives and then understanding where there aren't design alternatives, what the complexity, what the risk, what the, um, the additional content needs to be to give us a robust design. And so, um, so my master's continues and uh, hopefully into a PhD with the permission of my wife. Um, uh, and uh, there's, there's some clear targets. Having done the decomposition to feature level, I, th I think probably in the, within this room we can see that that starts to draw some of the geometric tolerancing that you, you, you talk, talked about, um, some of the geometric tolerancing into the design structure matrix, that there's then some requirements to be drawn within the components that are the geometric tolerances that relate them, um, both of feature groups and individual features. Um, we've got a functional design case study continuing on a, a new program at Jaguar Land Rover. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, we're going to apply the tools and we're going to apply the tools with the, the, uh, the engineers who are developing uh, the components. And then a real opportunity that um, I've only started to touch on in my master's work so far is the identification of the physical material energy and information exchanges. Um, physical uh, interfaces in the design structure matrix are location relationships. They're the things that set the parts in their, in their correct position. Material relationships probably don't have any particular relevance to geometry. Information may be flexibility, it may be tight tolerance requirements, it may be process content, and uh, uh, energy, sorry, energy is, uh, is those things. And in information would be uh, gaps and flushes and requirements that are required to be delivered to the, the situation. So, so these, um, this provides a real opportunity to, to get really good insight into the system and to project the location scheme over the top of the requirements that we've already uh, decomposed. So that, uh, that concludes my presentation. Uh, I don't suppose we can play that video from another, uh, another source, can we? Yeah. Tom? I, th I think it's well worth seeing. I have it on mine. Okay, well, we could. Okay, while we find the solution, do we have any uh, questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So,
or does the design structure the matrix uh, kind of showing up how your mapping is just put together? Have you tried to use the same analogy with the six dot uh, three freedoms like map a system and see if you have the right joints in and the ones are being applied to yeah, yeah. Um, it's an attempt to try and to try and create, you know, to, to understand the constraints before the geometry is really even available. So when we get lines on the clay, we can start to to draw those 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 components before we've even got geometry to be able to think about the degrees of constraint. And what I want to be able to do is to take the uh, take the requirements and to develop the necessary constraints, the necessary degrees of freedom constraints from the requirements and follow that system engineering process. So it's, for me it, it's a lot about ta the logical systems um, section, our dimensional concept, taking the requirements out of the, the design and trying to imply what that means geometrically um, for the design. I'd be really interested yeah, to see that. Because when, when you, I'm also trying to work with numbers who are in the axiom and, and trying to actually. Yeah. Could you just speak up a bit? Yeah, yeah. I'm also trying to work with the numbers who and actually use that to, to actually find out where are we coupling things together and where are we not. But I have been struggling a little bit with using the component strategy because what, what the problem is that the component and the way we split the component is mainly due to how the manufacturing processes are looking today. Yeah. And that means that component is really not the mechanical function of the system, because that is working more like how is the structure working together. And so I, I, I don't know if you're coming to that. I'm, I've just been struggling with using the component as the, um, as the driver for the, uh, for the uh, how can I say, the rows and the columns. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, I think certainly the component, it's, it's a starting point, isn't it? But you've really got to go beyond the component and understand the, the relationships within the component to, to, to you know, and, and that's where Nam Sur's um, uh, domain yeah. uh, zigzagging comes in, that when you, when, you achieve, when you find something that you can't achieve, you've got to kind of go back to your component concept and decide if that's the right design comp component. It's concept. just that the component is just a result of the last design and how that is manufactured. Yeah, yeah, very frequently, yeah, so it is. So, <laughs> so my problem is when it's really new design, I'm, I'm, I'm actually then starting the process with what was the with result of the last design. Baggage. And that, that is, for me, a little annoying because yeah. then I'm, I'm used to then, then suddenly I come to the argument that I need to do it the same way. Yeah, yeah. I think. I think really it's about drawing the constraints of the design out okay. and making some decisions, you know, using the yeah. tool to propose some design alternatives. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and if you've got a plastic moulding, it's going to be a plastic moulding is the answer, then, you know, that creates its own constraints, doesn't yeah. it? Okay, in a, a very flexible, agile way, how about we uh, try the video now and we can maybe inspire one or two more questions afterwards. Do you yeah, want to thank you. give the video go? <coughs> maybe you can hit the light as well.
The design feature I really love on this car, like most Jaguars, is the overall silhouette and the proportions. This car is visual movement in it. You can see it in the profile. It's got a proper length of bonnet. It's got this wonderful swooping cabin and a fascinating tail silhouette. But the two basic lines that run through the waistline that sweeps into the door, disappears and sweeps over the rear wing, as it does on the F-Type as well. Then it drops off onto quite a low tail relative to the waistline. And that proportion of the car I find very exciting. In Jaguar's history, we always create cars with a sense of style. And style in many ways can compromise the practicality in the space of the car because form takes up space. And this car, what we've done is managed to combine the element of space and style together. The essential part of this car when you get into it is it must feel like a driver's car and when you sit in it you do feel like you're in some sort of sports car. And to that end we have this wonderful line again, a Riva hood line that runs around the front of the car and it really encompasses the whole of the interior. It gives you a complete visual cabin. And there's a beautiful line which I really like on the door. I call it the chicane line. If you look at the trim leather line that comes up through the door it just gives it a sense of of movement and speed in the shape of the door. And the really great thing about the interior of this car is the space. It's got an enormous amount of space for five people in comfort, headroom, legroom, and then it's got a good size boot at the back. The F-Pace delivers something quite unique. It meets the demands of families and drivers alike. And it's wrapped up in a package which is hugely exciting to look at. But for me, this is really a turning point. The world will start to take notice of Jaguar in a way that they've never even considered before. And I think at this point, this car will be the fulcrum of a whole new era for the Jaguar Car Company. Um, do you want to hit the lights again, guys? Um, we have a uh, time for a couple more questions if uh, if anybody has any. Not we. I'm a bit curious. Of course, you always focus a lot on the pursuit part of it. Are you applying these methods of more drive train oriented systems as well? Do you talk about that or is it? Um, they tend to be a lot less sensitive. Um, we certainly are. You know, we certainly do take take notice of the robustness of the, the design tra train system, um, but they tend to be a lot less. You know, even in actual fact, the functional requirements of our gaps um, aren't the, the things that limit us. With in it's the perceived quality aspects of them. It's the 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 visual aspects of the gaps and interfaces in 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 the cosmetic world that limit us, and not their functionality. You know, we can make seals work within about two and a half millimeter range. But two and a half millimetres is very, very clearly visible when it's a, a variability in a gap. So, yeah, it's, it's a, a lot about sensitivity. Yeah, it's it's more to do with where really than. Um, you know, the, the kind of dimensional aspects. My focus is mainly on the body. If I can uh, give myself a question. Um, I noticed in one of your own slides you had um, describing the coupling by saying you have part one, uh, two, and then part three is the one on the diagonal of the matrix. Now, when we've been analysing this, we noticed that if there's a bi-directional constraint, meaning this locks this part in, in all degrees of freedom, and there's a bi-directional constraint here, and one here, there is a big coupling. But we also noticed that if it's only one direction, so the force path is going around in a loop like oh. this, you can often get away with, with these loops. Yeah. Um, I was wondering whether you've had any reflections on that. Yeah, I, th I think um, that, that's definitely something that's occurred to me, Tom. Um, the, the approach that I've taken is um, without prescribing a location scheme at this stage, so it's really to look at the, the relationships within the components um, without prescribing any kind of, do we need to locate that to that or that to that? 
um, and so they're bi-directional arrows to start with. And when we, you know, when we go to the, the um, physical material, energy and information, then you can start to, to say, well, actually, there's a, um, a location relationship between these two, and uh, coming the other way, there's a, a physical relationship that, that um, is a requirement to meet. And that's how you can separate the two, and I think do exactly what you're describing. I, I absolutely agree.